Germany. Well known for its engineering capabilities, as well as for its hunting culture. Has, perhaps unsurprisingly, blended these two things seamlessly into a rich history of gun making. And today, we're going to find out all about that. Look at the differences between Germany and the UK gun making trades, and discuss why German guns are not more popular. German guns in the British marketplace struggled to gain a foothold. They went down a different stylistic path to the guns that uh, we adopted certainly at the turn of the century in the zenith of, of British gun making. The style of German guns compared to the style of, of British guns was radically different. German guns stand out because they, they, sometimes, they very often have cheek pieces on them. They have horn trigger guards. Some of that horn work around the trigger guard can extend into the pistol grip as you can see here, a ornately carved pistol grip shape instead of carving it out of the wood or shaping the stock to produce a pistol grip. They tend to be much stronger actions and less, slightly less refined, but they are putting larger charges through for dual purpose guns. So shotguns designed to shoot feathered game, but also if a boar or a sound or a boar comes howling through the wood, that you can quickly swap out your bird shot, swap in your solid slugs and take on a pretty upset wild boar herring straight at you. It's something we didn't see in the UK because we didn't have a population of boar in the UK. They've been wiped out very much quite a long time before that, um, but there's always been a, a strong population in Germany. So the dual purpose guns that they had were stronger for that reason, and they just developed down a different style path to the very feathered game, driven game oriented style of shooting that we developed in the UK. So welcome to Holtz Auctioneers, where today we have been allowed to look through some of their German guns in the July 2022 sale. And we're going to kick off with a, a fairly early gun by modern sporting gun standards. Although guns have been in, made in Germany for a very long time, we're going to lead with these two, which are from the 1880s and 1890s. This little one here, we'll go out and shoot in a moment with Simon Reinhold, is absolutely stunning and is full of the hallmarks that make German guns German. And a lot of those things are perhaps just very different to someone used to certainly more British or perhaps more conventional American styles. This one has a particularly interesting opening mechanism of the pull-up lever on the bottom. When you pull that up, the gun opens. Look at these hammers, They're, the lines of them are just a little bit more aggressive than your standard English gun. And yet this gun has a lot of elegance. And if we pick this little sister gun up here, you can see a very similar line. You also see that there's almost a pistol grip in here. We'll go on to see that perhaps the pistol grip is more common in early German guns than it is in early British guns. This gun that has a love for show opening lever, in which you push this lever across to open it is actually from 1895. So it's a quite a bit later. And this has no particular maker on it, which is interesting because the quality is all there. And in fact, most of the German guns that we see, certainly in England, even those without names are of a decent standard. The F Geisinger of Heidelberg is actually from 1885. So it's relatively early, certainly for a breech loading hammer gun. Style-wise, completely different engraving style to your English guns. You have game scenes, you have that large vine leaf. I'm looking forward to shooting this.
It does kind of look like a hanging basket for flowers on the bottom. There's a lot going on there. But there's a lot going on down there, isn't there? That's, yeah. not, that's never there, a bad there's thing. There's a serious blend of materials on this gun. You've got some steel, some yeah. Damascus, yeah. some wood, yeah. some horn, yep. oh, some gold. <laughs> Don't forget the gold. And a cool opening mechanism. In fact, the whole gun is just... It's quite something, isn't it? It really is. I can't shoot out of that. Your heightest over here, I've noticed. Well, that shot slightly differently to where I thought it would. Nope. Too yeah. much. Gave it too much. Too much chop underneath it. It's a fun gun to shoot, but it took a little learning. Yeah. What What didn't take any learning is that opening mechanism. Yeah. It's the most it's intuitive, intuitive thing I've there, ever it. used. Yeah. Ooh. Lovely. Yeah, it's just, it's, it moves. It's so nicely balanced. It moves through the shot this with you. It. For a technical looper, which you don't often find in live quarry shooting, it's probably not the tool for the job. But for a lovely crossing target. Like anything straight line-ish is yeah. very pleasant. Yeah, it is. It flows beautifully. I mean, it's indescribable, isn't it? It's lovely. I mean, there's so much. Everything you want to see in a gun is there. A gun that different, it will take some time to get used to. But it's worth the effort. Yeah, I mean, well, I've done five shots and I was into it. Yeah, yeah just very natural feeling. Yeah. Lovely. What a gun. It's cracker. Straight over the top. Lovely. He even blew his glasses off. <laughs> blew my socks off this thing, did. What a lovely gun. It's very pretty. It is very pretty. It's and very, very pretty. It, I'll give it that. And the engravings on it are stunning. Are like lovely. You just don't find guns like that anymore, do you? Yeah, he likes it. Oh! Hey! <laughs> Soul! <laughs> you can't disregard German. a gun of that quality. When you see enough guns, you know a gun of quality. That is a gun of quality. It really is. Like you say, in terms of value for money, or, or quality workmanship yeah. for the money, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a wise investment for yourself. It's a beautiful thing. You'd never get tired of looking at that. <laughs> Before we put this gun away and go on through history, check this out. We push this over, the gun then opens on the scissor, oh, this is so wonderful, and then lifts out. Obviously the communications and travel weren't quite as good as they are nowadays back in 1885. And so whilst we in Britain were going down our route inventing guns that were very suitable for our sport inside of our circle, these guys were moving down a slightly different road. So the politics of Europe were affecting the gun making and the industry of Europe. You've got great political dynasties in France and Germany vying for power. You've also got Britain. This is post-Napoleonic era and the building of empire and the maintenance of that empire that they have built. There is a crossover between Austrian and German and French and German and Belgian and German. They were the, great, the channel was the great divide between the gun making styles, it seems to me anyway, in that we developed down a path of refined side lock ejectors with very carefully balanced stocks, actions and barrels and the weight distribution being evenly distributed over the whole gun. The Germans went down the style of heavily milled top ribs, almost acted like a sighting plane for their dual purpose guns, almost hogs back stocks in some places that we see on, on Continental rifles these days. You can see some of that in German shotguns as well. But their, yeah, their styles were influenced by the European style of gun making rather than the crossover from the channel. There was no swapping of, of artisan gun makers as we, as we saw in the UK gun trade. They didn't travel overseas. The sharing of technological knowledge and industrial knowledge did not happen between Britain, France and Germany in the way that it might otherwise have happened because they were all competing. Even though we had a royal house descended from Hanoverians, the German culture is not as popular in the rest of Europe as it is at home. Part of the reason of that was the Franco-Prussian War. They had a war in 1870 that radically altered the balance of power in Europe. The, Ger the Prussians won that, and a year later, Prussia drove the unification of Germany and the satellite, the, the city-states and, and states, the loose collection of states and federation that they were, into 
one country or you know, beginning to go towards one country. That was not a popular move in French politics or in British politics or in European politics generally because we are moving towards the era of war. This is a 1905 J.P. Sauer & Sons built for Lindner single barrel trap gun. It's an indicator of what the market was after, as any of these things are. If you'd have told me it was made in 2005, I'd believe you. Whether that's an indicator that Germans were ahead of their time, or that perhaps their style was ahead of its time, or that perhaps their style currently hasn't changed since back then and their style now is more popular, as we'll look at near the end of this video, begs an interesting question. But this has a 33 and a quarter inch ventilated rib trap barrel, beaver tail, long forend, very standard, or at least what would appear standard nowadays, loop and draw and hook and all the sort of things that you'd expect. An interesting thing about this gun is that it was made for black powder only in 1905, 10 years after black powder was mildly obsolete. Perhaps it was used for live bird shooting at a club where black powder was preferable, or perhaps the owner being an old boy didn't believe in that nitro powder crap. Who knows? It's amazing how times change and perceptions change that nowadays you go, why wouldn't you be adopting these new things? But we're all guilty of that sometimes. The strength of this action is obscene. The beauty here is that you have the bites in the bottom, but you also have a bifurcated lump that bites in the top in 1905. And those of you with a keen eye or a keen brain for guns will be going, hmm, well, that translates very interestingly into the development of early over and unders. So take it as you will that perhaps early English over and unders of quality owe something to this but who knows where they got their ideas from. There's no such thing as original ideas, just inspired ideas, right? And uh, we've said in the past that like, you can own a single barrel best gun or best quality single barrel for a fraction of the price of one with two barrels. Yeah. But you're getting all of the same feel and yeah. special stuff. Yes. So no safety catch. So, you know, you, this is trap shooting in 1905, this was built. So this is 117 it's years old. clay pigeons in 1905, just about. Uh, I would say they're still shooting live pigeons okay. at the time in Germany. Uh, and this is what this was built for. Shooting live pigeons? Um, yeah. In single barrel competitions, yeah. which they obviously still have single yeah. barrel trap today. And Atoll Purdy did the same thing. When he went across the States in the 30s, he was looking to build Purdy single barrels for the American trap market. Did they? Yes. Many? They did. Not many. Holland Holland built some as well, but not many. Mm. They're pretty rare. This is, yeah, very unusual. It feels good, doesn't it? Does. It does. An eight to 1200 pounds estimate. It's a cracker. And it would nitro proof, no problem. I mean, because yeah, it's the, the barrels, yeah, the barrels are built like a ship's hull. Why do you think so. it was black proof in 1905? It's, it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, the timing is wrong for it. Um, it's two and three quarter inch chamber as well. So <sighs> special loads for perhaps, I don't know, black powder only shooting live pigeon co uh, yeah, competitions, yeah. who knows? A so, special bloke. Yeah, quite so. Two further interesting things about this gun is that it has Prussia stamped on the inside of the action and Krupp Laufstahl on the outside of the barrel. The Krupp family is a 400 year old dynasty, best known for the manufacture of steel, ammunition and armaments. At the beginning of the 20th century, they were the largest company in Europe, making the majority of the weapons for the German military from the Thirty Years' War through to World War II. Fun fact, they also built the cap of the Chrysler building. The family and company hasn't been without its share of controversy and issues. However, it was around until 1999 when it merged with another German steel company. Why are German guns not more popular? The answer to that is it's a very simple answer. English guns sell better in England. German guns spell, sell better in Germany. Italian guns sell better in Italy. Everybody prefers to buy which was built in their country. It's, it's that simple. It really is. 
There is a slight throwback, of course, with the Mauser and the various other German mechanical designs that a lot of it is to do with the First and Second World War, of course. Do you think they represent good value for money? Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally, absolutely, 100%. Here is another example of bizarrely strong actions versus what we were producing at the time in England. 1910 this was built. The gun features side clips, a locking cross bolt in the top, so it's a treble gripped action, larger safeties, full pistol grip, and to give you an indicator of how undervalued this gun is when it's made to a very good standard, and certainly in the modern world where we're using stronger, more powerful cartridges, certainly steel ammunition with a little bit more recoil, these guns could be coming into their own. And this gun is valued at 100 to 150 pounds for a beautiful piece of history. If you parallel this gun next to an English gun from the same era, 1910, don't get me wrong, we were making some robust guns and maybe it's just the robust ones that make it over here. But it can't be a coincidence that every single German gun that we see seems to be built slightly stronger than the English equivalent. How do engraving styles differ between German and English guns through the popular gun making period, 1890 to 1950? Well, this is a little bit earlier, this example uh, from pre-1890, uh, but you can see the heritage that the German guns are going for. You're talking about guns commissioned like this were commissioned for the nobility of great houses of the German states, as we now know them, the, the schlosses, the castles. They have a large number of tapestries hanging on their wall. You can see the tapestry influence in these engravings here. Not only that, but they also go in for heavy carving on the stock as well, which we never really went for in the UK. Those are two of the main cultural differences. We go for Rose and Scroll later. We go for simplified game scene engravings. The Germans uh, go for this heavy Rococo influenced style of almost tapestry like hunting scenes. Some of them at slightly odd angles to try and engender a sort of dramatic uh, vision of the hunt itself, often with boar, often with hunting dogs chasing boar, things like that. Um, but it is Rococo in style uh, and that, that Rococo style that developed in France took hold in southern Germany, the great gun making heart of southern Germany. That is where this style was most heavily adopted in what we now know as southern Germany. So that is why you'll see this classic style of German heavy carving on their lock plates, heavy carving on their hammers, uh, and also on the woodwork as well. And that style is around today? Uh, it has lessened somewhat, but you can still look at um, Blaser's, you know, side-plated um, F-series shotguns, and you'll still that you'll still see that heavy hunting style of engraving on those on those side plates. So yes, it is still around. They they still hold that tradition dear to their heart, and it is it is glorious in its execution. It is not to everybody's taste. And because we're not familiar with it in the UK, it does not mean we should reject it out of hand. You can appreciate the artwork in it and the, the man hours that have gone into creating it, even if it isn't your taste. It takes some learning. It does. Yeah, it does. So as we were talking about the influence of German style and design, although it didn't cross the channel into the UK, it did cross Europe, and we can see it in one of the guns we have in the auction. This AYA here, you can see on these AYA over and unders the influence of German gun making. This is, uh, this is clearly influenced by the Merkel over and unders, and it was a uh, transplanted German with a Spanish Christian name, Eduardo Schilling, who took the German influence and this over and under style across Europe into the Basque country. And he was the man responsible for training uh, Miguel Aguilla and Nicolas Aranthabal. 
and that's why you see that German influence in there over and under. So this is a bolt action with a Mauser action from the year 1900. The Mauser action was developed in the latter half of the 19th century in the late 1800s. Obviously, 1898 is when the most famous action type was coined, if you like. This particular gun is interesting. It's a proper blend between the German and Austrian styles, and without looking where it was made, you could have been forgiven to think it was Austrian. The caliber is 8x56 Mannlicher Schönauer, and Mannlicher and Schönauer were Austrians. And I suppose it's at this point when we think about geographically, if you remove the borders from the map, it can get quite confusing. This rifle in itself is a beautiful thing. It sees some development from the early hammer guns, but you can still see traces of the old style. The steel pistol grip goes into a horn pistol grip halfway, so there's a blending there. You have a semi pistol grip, that Prince of Wales with the rounded knob. I love the uh, floor plate in this and how it opens up. So if we put this to one side this, and we pick up this, this is a Rigby Mauser. This Rigby Mauser is made quite a bit later and you can see the basic action design has been refined a bit, but is very similar. If we look at the military side, which the Mauser is probably equally well known for, you have this 1920s Spandau, 1916 pattern, and this Paraguay Mauser. It's an interesting thing to think that that one action has really been one of Germany's most famous exports. World War I had a huge effect on the world. with the war lasting from 1914 to 1918. The German infantry were equipped with a vast array of sidearms and rifles. Bear in mind that Germany were allied with Austria-Hungary and that each country made armaments for one another. The war ended with Allied victory, the collapse of the German Empire, and the removal of the German monarchy. Post 1918 with the armistice, there were some issues with German gun making. It took its first major hits, and that was for two reasons. Firstly, an entire generation of men had spent four years fighting the Germans. Suddenly, German produce wasn't as popular as it once was. There was an anti-German sentiment. And I think, you know, we can all understand why. But the real issue came with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, in which Article 177 banned all civilian use of firearms. If you were caught using firearms, there was a five-year prison sentence and an up to 100,000 mark fine. They really didn't want people using guns, and the reasons for that are also fairly obvious. As with any firearms licensing, it obviously got messy, there were some issues, and it wasn't a perfect solution. So in about 1928, they wrote in a first set of proper firearms laws to back up the Treaty of Versailles. Interestingly, you could actually own firearms under these laws. However, the Treaty of Versailles still banned their use. Kind of confusing, huh? The interesting thing about that 1928 date is I actually have two guns here from 1928. Maybe that makes you think that these guys had been producing some stuff and stockpiling it, ready to have it proofed and finished for 1928. Or it's a complete coincidence. The first is an over and under shotgun. And that's also interesting because you see perhaps more common 1920s over and under German guns than you do English guns. They were perhaps quicker to adopt that, although looking at some of those guns from the turn of the century, they were already looking for this kind of thing. 
more importantly, when we look at this combination gun, the, the idea of putting one barrel on top of another of different styles, stacking the barrels as opposed to paralleling the barrels, perhaps was a, a more accepted practice. And perhaps maybe that's why it took a little long for it to go kick off in England. Maybe over and unders were seen as a German thing. But this is a 16 bore Kern over and under. It's absolutely beautiful. And you can see, unlike English guns that are perhaps more at this point, Rosen Scroll, Finery, occasional game scenes, you've actually got large animals on the sides of these guns. And there's some, some interesting things there to think that culturally, our hunting cultures are just so very, very different. Again, we can see even in the 20s, the horn trigger guard is there. The crossbolt through the top is there. It is a non-ejector, but this is very much a practical hunting gun. If you line that up next to this, a certainly a more common name, J.P. Sauer and Sons. This is a drilling. And it's at this point you start to see a little flavor of perhaps something we never embraced in England quite so much. Yeah. We made a triple barrel shotgun and a few other things, but the Germans made some absolute weldies with as many barrels as you could stick together, much like their Austrian counterparts. The concept of a drilling is simple. You have two shotgun barrels with a rifle barrel underneath. You can take this out, you can shoot whatever you want with it. It's one rifle to take out and bring home meat. You're never gonna be underdone. And whereas in England, birds were king, the boar and the stag really were equally as important in Germany. Large game has a much richer tradition, right? The mechanics of a combination gun are beautiful. Certainly, this one is no exception. Before we look at it, it's worth mentioning that J.P. Sauer and Sons, that I think, you know, they started in 1751. After Versailles, they had to make typewriters for a few years. And they got back on their feet just before World War II, but it's just it's really interesting to see how these people are diversified to keep alive. This gun has a safety catch on the side. That is the safety catch for the shotgun. If you leave this top pulled back, you have the side safety. When you're ready to shoot the shotgun, you click that down like this and bang, bang. Very simple. However, if you want to shoot the rifle, and I love this, you push the safety catch on top forward. That engages the rear sight. This sour is actually quite rare in that it's two 12 bores. Here's another example of the practicality of German hunting guns. This is a 16 bore over a 7x57R. You have a roe deer on one side and very un-English acanthus scroll. And on the other side, you have a red stag. The hunting cultures were different. And as such, the guns produced were different. Hunters were after different things. Some of those earlier guns, they were actually quite similar. But the, the divide grows, the divide does grow. I am a big fan of combination guns. Again, not hugely popular in the UK, but as such, you can pick these up for a real bargain here. Unlike the Americans, the Germans did not have a shotgun employed in World War I in the trenches. In fact, they didn't even have a combat shotgun in World War II. They put their focus gun-wise, military-wise at least, into different areas. And in the 20s, whilst the Americans were coming up with some of the best pump action and semi-automatic shotguns known to man, this is what Wolfer came up with. Designed in the late teens, and made from 1921 to 1931, 1932. It's a wolf -a toggle action. They only made about 5,000. And that will, you know, when J.P. Sauer and Sons in the 30s were making 10,000 hunting guns a year, we'll put into perspective that those numbers aren't massive for a company like Wolfer. You have to pull this toggle down, load, close the chamber with a button on the bottom, Pull a lever on the side, the magazine drops down, load it up, close it up, safety off on the front here, and away you go. You can see the roots of a lot of military firearms design-wise here. There is some difference in gun fit uh, because 
the UK game shooting scene was very much as it developed over the latter part of the 19th century, it moved towards driven game shooting specifically as the breech loader was invented, which curiously came across, that's one of the crossovers from the channel, is Le Fachot bringing over um, his patent breech loader for the Great Exhibition. And British game shooting was very much driven game oriented by the time we get to 1880, whereas there, were, there was less of a tradition of the Great Batu of driven pheasants or partridges on the continent. They had driven game, obviously, they were doing great battues of, of driven uh, cloven hoofed game um, from, you know, great tracts of forest being brought forward towards a waiting team of guns, sometimes 20, 30 strong. And therefore they're taking a, a great many of their shots in a, a far lower angle than the game shooting in this country where the angle is you know, at a far higher angle. So they have many cheek pieces on their guns to almost line their, their shotguns up like rifles to shoot, sometimes going away feathered game, sometimes low coming towards them feathered game, but also to make it easier to swap over those uh, cartridges and shoot furred game as well, or cloven hoof game. Throughout the late 30s and early 40s, Germany was at war again. However, that did not stop them building hunting guns. Obviously, the rich, the famous, and people still enjoyed hunting, even during the war. And this is a 1943 8x57 JRS double rifle, which was made in the middle of the war. Nobody put their name on it, but it has some interesting features. You'll have noticed that during that period of time in England, we were obsessed with side lock side by sides. These guys were playing with trigger play over and unders, which is where we currently are popularity wise now. This gun isn't even a side lock, it's a side plated gun. And the way that the action is dropped right to the back with the, the short horn of wood at the top with the side plate bolted into the side, cocking indicators, this is a, a very nice probably overcomplicated but oversimplified design. It's just of interest to me that side plates really did start to become popular at this period of time. One of the features about this gun that I wanted to show you is the quick release mount system. What's quite interesting is that culturally, Germany and Austria are well into their proprietary mounting systems as we'll see towards the end. And to think that that culturally is stuck around to today whilst the Americans are more into their Picatinny bases and. The English don't make that many rifles, unfortunately. It's just an interesting observation. And so we see the return of the mighty 98 action, this time in a K98. And I, forgive me for this not being the perfect model, but there's not a person who doesn't know what a K98 is. Could it be the most famous gun in the world after the AK-47? Potentially. And here we have an example of one of the other most famous guns that they made. This is an MG34, the predecessor to the MG42 that was made for about 20% less money to a slightly less complicated pattern from 1942. An interwar change to save some money. But this iconic gun was originally designed in about 1928, tested in 1929 and issued in 1934 and used, well, coincidentally, up until about 1945. But the design was so good that it still stands up today. You know, this gun, or not this gun, but this model of gun has been used in most conflicts around the world since, up to and including, they've been used in the Syrian conflict over the last few years. It's, when we talk about German guns being robust, there's not a gun here that still doesn't stand up today. And because of that, perhaps, lack of refinement, and I mean that with the utmost respect, you get a longer working life out of it. Interesting fact of the day is that the early MG34s had a select fire option. And by select fire, I mean you could choose whether it shot 600 rounds a minute or 1,000 rounds a minute. Later models, well, they just shot 1,500 rounds a minute. This is a very deadly weapon.
Rather sadly, World War II wasn't kind to any gun making trade. Most of the talent was made up making guns for the war effort, be that in Germany or in England. And so you lost a lot of talent, be that through having to move to other departments or being called up to go and fight. Inherently, the focus was no longer on making fine sporting guns, but on making weapons of war. Mix that with a lot of bombing, the, the sour factory at the end of the war being occupied by the Americans and being handed over to the Soviets, 18 of their buildings were flattened. It takes a while to come back from that. Uh, there was a similar situation in the UK and the world over. History repeats itself. There are sanctions. Businesses are sold off. Take Diana. Diana was sold off in entirety to Milbro, and all the machinery and all the production of Diana was moved to Scotland. And a few years later, someone took up the same designs, was making them in Germany under Original, original. But it just puts a country and a society and a gun making culture back. Because I think between what, 1945 and 1950, 51, making guns was pretty much banned. To use J.P. Sauer as an example once again, as well as having 18 of their factory buildings flattened, once the Soviets took over, they took all their machinery, dismantled it, took it home, did whatever they wanted with it. They were left with pretty much nothing. Another company started in their stead, and eventually in 1951, they, they bought the J.P. Sauer name, and that company that started, started from the roots of what Sauer was, from the Sauer family. It was a tough time. I think historically for sporting gun makers, it was a tough time. Simon, through all of my coming here and learning about guns, it's like a period in the 50s, 60s and 70s that nobody ever talks about. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's an awkward subject in gun making. Principally, let's, let's not beat about the bush. The industrial and economic forces that were going on in the 50s, 60s and 70s, you're talking about a post-war period where Europe is in turmoil. Uh, the, the Iron Curtain has gone up, Germany is cut in half, uh, and everybody is suffering from the financial ruination that it was the, the Second World War. So that naturally depresses uh, economic forces, everybody's under heavy taxation for governments to get out of jail and get out of hock, basically. And industry is suffering. The clients who are they're building these guns for are, have no longer got the disposable income. Uh, in Europe, uh, again, the, the post-war influences of controls over industrial manufacturer, gun manufacturer particularly, are having their effect and quality is dropping. And as we get into the 70s, you're moving into industrial action. You're moving into heavy left-wing politics influencing how industry works. And we go down to a three-day week and the quality simply isn't there. So it is industrial forces and political forces influencing the production of fine quality firearms. And we're not saying that they never, no good guns were ever made in that period because there were some but they are fewer and further between. This is not just a UK-wide thing, this is a European-wide exercise. I mean, Beretta, during the Second World War, switched their industrial production straight over to war production, as did Browning in Belgium. So everybody was affected by the forces of war, uh, and it lasted 30 years. So welcome to the modern era. This is a Kriegov K80. The Kriegov K80 came from the Kriegov K32. The Kriegov K32 was a redesigned and improved M32 uh, at Remington. They changed some things, they upgraded some things, and then in 1980 they upgraded it into this. That was 1957 to 1980 they made the K32. So if you're asking what the Germans did post-war, as well as what we've just covered, that was a key part of it. The interesting thing about the K80 slash K32 is although they had their roots in America, and uh, American guns and German guns have, have some commonalities in robustness and versatility of use, but this is quite German. Like there's a theme of robustness and quality that have gone through 
pretty much everything we've looked at. And I just find that fascinating. I don't know why. But they're not Germany's only existing gunmaker who is still producing great guns today. Blaser. They make the F-16 and the F-3 shotguns, but they make probably one of the most successfully sold rifles in the world. The R-8. It's funny to think that throughout history, everything peaks and troughs and every country hits the mark a little bit better than others at certain points. But seemingly today, in 2022, the new German guns are ruling the roost. And yet the older German guns are still underappreciated. It's strange to me. Blaser with their F3 had some brilliant technology in it as well. Their engineering standards are higher. It's a generalization to say Germans are greater engineering, but certainly it's a good generalization. And I think people would agree with me to say that German guns are well engineered. They still make double rifles and combination guns. This is a old Blaser 97, now it's the K95. There is still a booming gun trade for some of those more niche guns that we saw early on, combinations, drillings. However, the world has changed and it's easy enough to take two guns. Access to the backcountry is bigger and we hunt less for, you know, we don't hunt to live anymore. And we haven't done that probably for 70 years. And so the gun market does change. It's interesting to think that new German guns hold their value very well. So buying a new one is a great investment, but buying a old one is great value. We go back to the style and taste thing that Simon said in another video. Taste is knowing what to buy, style is knowing how to pull it off. And here we have a Sauer 202. Again, one of the most beautiful bolt action rifles known to man. In the modern era, it was known as the quality bolt action rifle. And I think this gunmaker has been around for well, since 1751. It's made its way and survived through two world wars where it almost didn't make it through to be producing extremely popular, extremely good quality guns like this. Summarize your thoughts on German gun making. I think some of the German guns that we see, not all of them, but some of the German guns that we see are grossly undervalued, grossly underrated by the UK gun buying public. We see really high quality gun making. We see very, very well executed engraving. If it is your taste, if the stock dimensions are right for you and you can appreciate some of the work that has gone into these, you can pick yourself up an incredibly well made gun for very little money. And I'm talking 100 to 150 pounds. So it is, it's, it's a section of the auction business that we have that you should really consider and I think is grossly undervalued. They differ in style, they're not everybody's cup of tea, but actually the work that's gone into them, the quality that you can get, uh, the fit and finish is really, really good. I mean, really exceptional value for money in the current climate, so don't disregard them. Our auction catalogues are all live online now. We, you have four ways to bid. You can bid in person on the day in the room. You can, if you cannot get to the room, you can also organize a phone bid, but you can bid live online during the auction uh, via the sale room or in Valuable, two different platforms that will host your bids for us on our behalf. You can also leave a commission bid, which you write down what you want to bid, uh, factor in the commission that you have to pay as well, which is 25% plus fat, please don't forget that. You can buy from all over the world. Please do check the shipping costs depending on where you are and the licensing requirements of the country you are in, please, because they do vary across the world. And uh, happy bidding.